always here. But we can feel it stronger than sometimes other times. And he is at work this morning. Amen. Before I begin, does anybody have a testimony that they would like to share? I know. Oh, okay. You can't just tell them my testimony. I have to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Figure she get out of her system now. <laughs> I just want to give God the praise and the glory for bringing me through um, the COVID that I went through in the hospital. I was by myself, and Jesus and I we had some good times there. I wouldn't ask. I would ask God never to take that away from me because. I got really, really close to God. And one of the things that God has put in my heart, and I pray that it never ever comes out, is um, Jairus, I can't say what, Jairus' daughter was dead. And um, they said, don't, don't go, because why worry? The, 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 lad is, the, the lass is dead. And you know what? Jesus went, he believed, and he took her, Jesus took her hand and she rose up from the dead. One thing God, Jesus put in my heart very, very strongly is Jesus says yes. Jesus says yes. You know, and you will say, oh, well, this cancer, you know, it can't be healed. It's just way gone too far. No, this person can't be healed. This person can't be saved. This person, below me, because Jesus himself told me, Jesus said yes. Yes, Jesus says yes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only ones that are different is us. We need to know when we get discouraged that Jesus said yes. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. Jesus. I want to thank God for keeping his hands upon our family over the past few weeks. <laughs> It's been an eventful summer. I would say with all the things that we have gone through, uh, God has kept his hand upon us. It's, uh, it's just been so many things when we had COVID while we were away. We got that out of, the, out of the way for the year. Yes, uh, yeah. Put us out for a few weeks. Down to no vehicles. One vehicle that we had an accident with before we left. And we didn't know it, but as we traveled through the mountains of Tennessee and the highways in Ohio and over the Poconos in Pennsylvania, that we was driving a vehicle with the subframe about gone. And where the struts are, there was these things that hold the back end of your car up. And man, that car was afraid. Uh, coming home, we had a few people that kept rolling down the windows your tire that was laying just like this while we were driving home. And I don't know how that we didn't lose that rear end on the highway. Uh, but God kept his hands upon us because it was like that for some time and we didn't know it. And we drove it. The only car we had left to drive, we drove it. And God kept his hands upon us. Amen? God is good. God is good. How many of you remember the last message I preached? What it was? Another hint. My <laughs> call <a> friend. <laughs> Don't feel bad, I had to look it up myself. <laughs> it was the in between times. And that, the message was David, a man after God's own heart, and it was about the in-between times. Well, this is a continuation of that. You know how you get into a good TV series, and then bam, out of nowhere, you got the, the mid-season finale? And then you get, get okay, we're going back. Right? So, the message I'm going to talk about today is that David, a man after God's own heart, but how can we be one of these? How can we be a person after God's own heart? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you, Lord God, for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask you to anoint this vessel. Let only what you have to say come out of this vessel. I pray you would open the hearts to the people this morning to receive it. Just have your way this word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Well, David was one of these men. David is one of my favorite people in the Bible to, to read, talk about. I don't, can't imagine why. But there are 66 chapters that are written about him. I think God wants us to know a little something about David. I think we can learn a little something. But Job was one of these men, too. There was many people uh, in the Bible that were people after God's own heart. But I was thinking, often sometimes I do, wouldn't it be nice for God to choose me like he chose Job? Out of all the people in the world at that time, he picked Job. Here the devil was roaming the earth, and he goes to God, and they're having a conversation. And God, he says, God, I'm paraphrasing. This is David's version. God, there is nobody on this earth that loves you. That if you tempt him, and if you take his away, won't curse you. And he says, consider Job, can you imagine? Oh, I would like God to consider. I wouldn't want to be the one that goes what Job went through, would you? <laughs> no, I don't want to go through that stuff. But I would think it would be an honor for God to choose me to prove that he was right. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 13, chapter 13, verse uh, 5 through 15. We're going to talk about Saul a little bit this morning. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And the people as the sand, which is on the seashore in multitudes. This is what it seemed like. This is how many Philistines were coming to battle. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Aven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed. Then the people hid in caves, they hid in the thickets, they hid in the rocks, they hid in holes. They pretty much hid wherever they could find a spot. And the ones they couldn't hide, some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. For Saul, he was still in Gilgal. And all the people followed, trembling. And then he waited seven days according to the time that Samuel said that he would come. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and a peace offering to me here. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened that as soon as he had offered the offering, as soon as he had offered it, and he had finished presenting the burnt offering, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, Well, when I saw the people were scattered from me, and you did not come, then I said, The Philistines will now come down from Gilgal. And I have not made supplication to the Lord. And therefore I felt compelled, I felt compelled, and I offered the third offering. See, the responsibility lay on Saul. He was the king. But he was not. He was a man of battle. He had blood on his hands. The Lord of God says, you're not to offer the sacrifice. The priest is to offer the sacrifice. And Samuel said to him, what have you done? If you have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever. Now listen to that. The Lord would have established your kingdom forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought after himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over your people. And because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you, then Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal to Gibeah and Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him was about 600. Now I'm not giving Saul an excuse here, but think about the situation Saul was in. He only had 600 men and the Philistines had 30,000 men. Now if you're not relying on God and you're and people relying on you, 
and you're working in the flesh, what are you thinking? All these people are going to die. These people I'm supposed to make sure are protected as well as fighting. But he took it upon himself to not wait on the priest. How can we be a person after God's own heart? In direct disobedience to the lowest command, King Saul left some animals at King Agag from the Amalekites alive. He offered the sacrifice, and Samuel responded, You have done this so foolishly, and not kept the commands that your Lord gave you. If you had, you would have established a kingdom forever. And I got thinking of this. And this is, falls into what I very strongly agree with is the law of sowing and reaping. Samuel, uh, Saul, sold into his own self. He sinned, and the repercussions of that was he lost his kingdom. But as we were in Pennsylvania, and all the times I've gone to Hershey, I've never gone on a tour of the, of the town. And this time we decided to go on a town of the tour where they heard the history of the town and of Hilton, or Milton Hershey. And this man left a legacy today that we still enjoy. Actually, it's pretty sweet, isn't it? No pun intended. But he was a humble man. He, 37 years, the first 37 years, he grew up poor, he had nothing. He didn't have a high school that he finished his education, he was in seventh grade, his father didn't believe, and having an education, believed in just working to support the family. But this man, 37 years, he failed at trying to make chocolate. He failed. He lost everything. He filed bankrupt several times. And his aunt believed in him. And she put her house up to him. And he was the day that they were going to take her house. There was a breakthrough. And he was made a deal with a person that wanted to, that he knew how to make caramel. This, and this guy wanted the caramel. And he made the deal. And that changed his life forever. And I can go on and on of all the things this man did. I don't know if he was a Christian. I'm just saying he was a man that gave. And one of the things that struck me when they were talking about this man, if we could only learn, people learn, it's just money. We hang on to it. But it's not just, it, 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 the law of sowing and reaping, and I don't know why I'm going here, is not, but I just want to say this, that you cannot give God. Yes. You cannot give God at all. But during the Great Depression, this man gave everything he had. He had a multi-million dollar company. During the Great Depression, he sold everything and gave it to his employees. He took the money and built the houses in Hershey Park, in Hershey, for his employees. During the Great Depression, because he wanted to keep them going. He didn't want his, his employees to go without. He also built houses for the surrounding communities in Hershey. He was bringing the, as many people he could in to keep them working during the Great Depression. He sold, gave away his millions. I could go on and on. I was so fascinated. He would build houses for employees at cost. They could buy them off him at cost. And you know what? If they could not afford to buy the houses, he owned the bank and financed them the money to buy the houses at zero to no interest. And we look at his what his company is today. You just can't outgive God. But how could David, now that I've said that, let's go back to where I'm going. How could David, a man with so many flaws, be considered a man after God's own heart? David had a lot of things, a lot of mistakes that he made. But we see, we tend to judge people according to their sin. Oh, that's a bad one. Especially if it's a sin that's against us. Oh, that one can't be forgiven. That's a bad sin, but that one ain't quite so bad. But 
See, we don't see the heart of man. Only God sees the heart of man. And the reason David was a man after God's own heart can be found in Acts 13, 22. It says, he will do everything that I want him to do. Let's look here at some of the specifics in this part of David was obedient. Number one, the key to being a person after God's own heart is being obedient. Saul spared the Amalekites, but David did not in full obedience to the Lord. David didn't obey God out of a sense of rigid uniformity or a set of rules, but he obeyed God because he wanted to. Now we know he made a lot of mistakes, and he paid for those mistakes, but he always sought after God. He wanted to please God. He loved God. But obedience shouldn't be a chore. It shouldn't be a burden or a weight, a duty. It should be an honor or delight. You have those people that are not saved say, oh, you can't do anything. It must not be fun being a Christian. Oh, you can't do this. You can do this. I can do anything I want to do. It's a joy being a Christian. It's an honor being a Christian. It's an honor to serve God. <clears throat> it's not a duty. But when I was younger, growing up, I served God out of fear. Out of fear. Out of fear I was going to go to hell. That was what I served God. I believed. I don't want to do this guy. I might go to hell. But as I got older and I realized my relationship with God, I remember it's an honor. I don't fear God out of, I don't, I, I don't serve God out of fear that I'm going to go to hell. I serve God because I love Him. When I was younger, I would, I would do things that were wrong. If I broke something, I would hide it. And hopefully not get caught. Well, my wife would say I'd probably still do it today. <laughs> if I break something, I would try to fix it and put it in the bag and hope that I don't find the wrath of Sandy. But it just doesn't get found. Sometimes it does. Months, years later, and then I can play like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> but when I was younger, I would get mad, go to the next door, break the next door, and neighbors toys. <laughs> One time I set the back field on fire. That one I can still feel. I... <laughs> but those are things I won't forget. And doing those things, I would feel, uh oh, I'm going to get a spanking. I'm going to, and I, and I did. But now that I'm older, I don't fear that my parents are going to spank me. I'm not worried about my father putting me over his knee. However, if I do something wrong today, I worry that I'm going to let him happen. My fear is I'm going to let my parents down. Not that I'm going to get a spank. And this is where we need to be in our walk with our Heavenly Father. Because at some point, we're all going to mess up. But are we going to be remorseful for it? Do we obey God out of a sense of fear and obligation or out of a sense of love and appreciation? Don't ever feel like don't ever feel like because you're not perfect, God can't use you. I can't do this for God. Yes, you can. But I have this in a way. Well, God will work it out. Don't ever feel like. I've met people that aren't saved. It's, oh, God don't want me. He doesn't want me. I, I'm too bad. No. We're never going to be perfect until the day we die. And we've got to understand that God needs every one of us. He wants to use every one of us. He wants a relationship with us. But don't ever feel like He can't use you. Yes, we don't want to sin. We want to strive to be all that Christ wants us to be. 
But this brings me to point number two, and that is we must be repentant. See, Saul deflected his disobedience onto someone else. It's Samuel's fault. Samuel wasn't here. Seven days, Samuel. Come on. What was you doing? He deflected his sin. Well, the people maybe, though they were in fear, they were hiding in caves. I had to. There was an excuse. But when it comes to sin, it's nobody's fault but our own. It's nobody's fault. Psalms 51 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to the great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. God uses flawed people, but only those with a repentant heart, not those that are full of pride. When he went to the well in Samaria and he met the woman, what did he say? As he was chatting with her, go and get your husband. He knew she didn't have a husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He goes, I know. You've been married five times. The man you live, the man you're with right now is not your husband. It was something when he did that, said that, when he spoke to her, and she come to acknowledge, look, I need him. That something changed within her. And she had a desire from that point on to seek after God. Those who, who need to be people that have a love for God's word and desire his presence. Because he won't, he won't push himself onto us. He won't force himself no matter how much he desires us, how much he desires us to serve him, he'll wait on us. But David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. In Psalms 27, verse 4, he says, One thing I've asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord, to seek him in his temple. We need to be careful to follow the voice of the Holy Spirit. You see, I don't know what the voice of the Holy Spirit is. Yes, you do. It's that voice of reason. It's that voice of reason that speaks to us. That when we listen to, it takes us to the place that God wants us to be. And when we don't, we usually end up in a place that we don't want to be going through something that we wish we didn't have to go through. So we need to be obedient. We need to have repentance. And we need to have absolute faith in God. King Saul and his army were dismayed. And they were terrified at the thought of Goliath. There are also, this was earlier on. They also were terrified at Micmash when Saul was fighting the Philistines. That if, imagine if Saul had absolute faith in God. Imagine if he was following the lead of the Holy Spirit. If his desire was to do all that Christ wanted to do, Imagine the turnout it would have been. First of all, he wouldn't have lost his kingdom. Second of all, he would have won the battle. But we see here with Goliath that they were in fear. All of the Israelites that were on the battlefield. And the king was offering even a reward for a person that would come forward. But we know that David was coming. His father sent him to his brothers with some food. And when he got there, he noticed that, wait a minute, this man is cursing my God. This man is cursing our people. And a boldness came He was furious. And he went to the king and said, I'll take this man out. Can you imagine? Skinny, scrawny kid coming to the king where he has all these soldiers, men that can fight. 
and the exile will take him out. He says, you can't take him out. He says, well, the Lord delivered me from the, the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, and he'll deliver me from this man. He had absolute faith that God could do it. I wonder if it was from all that time he had out in the fields to spend with God. I don't know. Just a thought. But may our faith arise in spite of the odds surrounded by unbelievers, regardless of your circumstance. Believe God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. See, now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now think about this. Why are they describing this so thoroughly? Having five porches, and these lay in a great multitude of sick people. They have five porches around a multitude of sick people. Blind, lame, paralyzed, all waiting for the water to stir. For an angel that went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease they had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, sir, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming, another one steps in front of me. 38 years. Think about that. I'm just a little over 40. Just a little. But can you imagine 38 years? What caused this man to stay at that place for 38 years? I mean, he could have went at the city gates and begged and made his way and said, you know, this is, the, this is what it is. I mean, if it was me, I don't know if I would make it two or three years and say, okay, God, I guess you're not ready to heal me. I'm going to do something else because I'm not going to stand here and watch the water stir. And any time the water stirs, a blind man jumps in in front of me. A blind man jumps in in front of me because I can't move. What was his mindset? Why was he there for 38 years? Even though he never had a chance of reaching that water. He never had a chance before anyone else. But I like how the episode in The Chosen that deals with, that talks about this particular event. The way they portray it. I don't know how biblically accurate it is, but I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is something to me that Jesus would do. Paraphrasing. I can see Jesus now. As he's coming to the pool. Now Jesus planned to go there that day. He was headed there for a reason. That was his agenda for the day. That day was, okay, heal me in the pool today. That was his agenda. But he gets there and he says to the man, out of all the people, God, he could have healed anybody there. He could have healed everybody there. Why did he go there to that man? Why was that man? Because that man had so much faith. 38 years of faith that man had built up inside him, just waiting, just waiting for Jesus to come. And then Jesus asked the man, do you want to be healed? Well, I have, will you take me to the pool? Jesus says, no, I'm not going to take you to the pool. Can you imagine the discouragement that man felt? No, I'm not going to take you to the pool. That's not what I asked you. I asked you, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? See, that man, for 38 years, had faith in the water and the angel that was coming to stir the water. That's where his faith was. But he needed to have faith in Jesus. Mm -hmm. See, he needed to know who Jesus was. And when Jesus said, do you want to be healed? I think the light bulb went on in his head after he said, no, I'm not going to take you to the water. Well, 
God just knew he wanted to be healed. He knew he had the faith. So when he said, do you want to be healed? Jesus already knew what was going on in the mind. He said, yes, I want to be healed. And immediately the man got up and took his bed and walked. See, he needed to have faith in Jesus. I remember at one point in my life, I needed to know who Jesus was. I was brought up in church. I was saved in church. I know who Jesus is, but I didn't know who Jesus was. My relationship was, I didn't know who Jesus was. And when I was first married, Sandy couldn't have kids. And I wrote, my mother was going to a Benny Hen crusade. And I said, well, I can't go, but if I can get word to him, maybe he can heal my wife, she can have kids. So I wrote a note, and I was pretty specific. God, please heal my wife. I want to have a baby girl. And I gave it to my mother, and she went to the Benny Hen concert, uh, concert crusade. But little did I know that that note never made it to Ben Hinn. Because my mother prayed. She didn't get down to the altar. But she was there. But she prayed over that note. And when she came back and told me that, my mindset was changed. I didn't need Ben Hinn. Especially when I realized it wasn't any year, nine months later, my wife was pregnant. I had a baby. Well, not nine months later, she was pregnant. She was pregnant not too long after that. And nine months, later, nine months later, we had a baby. But it was that point in my life that I had to learn, listen, it isn't Benny Hinn or any other televangelist or any other person that has the, the ministry of healing. It's not them. It is Jesus. It is Jesus that I needed to seek. See, he believed. Think about this. He believed. What is the biggest obstacle that you have that's causing you not to have the faith? What's hindering you from becoming everything that God has created you to be. <clears throat> it's easy for us to have faith when it's somebody else's circumstances. It really is. It is for me. I know if you come to me and say, can you pray for this? I, ha I can have some great faith. God's going to do what I pray for for you. God's going to answer my prayer. I believe he can do it. But for all of us, when it's our situation is different. We might have faith. We might have that supernatural faith. And then if God don't do it right away, well, maybe a year goes by and, and the situation hasn't changed, we start to say, oh, I don't know. I know God can do it, but is he going to do it? I don't know. But we got to learn as hard as it is to have that absolute faith in God. That no matter what our situation is, no matter what we're going through, no matter what it is, God is, can, and will Follow through with it in his time. But as we seek him, as we seek the Holy Spirit, he'll speak to us and he'll verify in us, okay, this is going to be the time. Or not right now, but it will be done. That's how we become a man or a woman after God's own heart. What's hindering you from becoming everything that God wants you to be? Well, I'm happy right now, right where I am. I'm happy with my walk with God. I'm happy with, well, so was Saul. Saul was happy where he was at. He was, he was the king. We should never be satisfied at where we are. No matter how long we've been a Christian, no matter how long we've been with our walk with God, we should never be satisfied where we are. We should strive to be everything that God created us to be. Tim, if you would come, Rachel. As I wind down here a little bit. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 12 through 17, I tell you the truth. 
that anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater. Because I am going to be with the Father. Do we understand Amen. this? Do we understand this in our spirit? Amen. I tell you the truth. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. So he's saying it to us. I tell you the truth. That anyone that believes in me is that absolute faith. Will do the same works I have done. And even greater. I don't know you, but we've seen what Jesus has done. We've read what Jesus has done. And we can do greater. Yes. Amen. That the very presence of God where he walked healed people. Just where Jesus went. Can you imagine that everywhere that you walked, people were healed? That when you walk in the Dunkin' Donuts eating coffee, you want the Holy Spirit speaks to you. When you speak to the person that's cashing you out, and you change their life forever because of the Holy Spirit working through you, because you're obedient, because you can do greater things than Jesus did. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So the Son, why? Why did he watch this? So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. He wants us to bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Ooh, hallelujah. The key also is, if you love me, obey my commandments. So we not only have to have absolute faith, but we have to be obedient to his commandments, to his word, to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. And he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. We are never alone. The moment we accepted Jesus Christ in our life, we are never alone. He is the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. See, the world cannot receive him because they aren't looking for him. It's our job to bring him to them. They don't recognize who the Holy Spirit is. But you know him because he lives in you. And will later be in you. I don't know that about you, but God isn't finished with us yet. I don't think He'll be finished with any of us until we take our last breath. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says this. Know therefore that the Lord your God is good. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations. Of those who love him, of those who love him, of those that that seek him, those who desire after him, those are the things I added. But this is there, and those that keep his commandments. See, he's not done with us. He's not done with us. He's not done with our children. He's not done with our grandchildren. He's not done with our great grandchildren. Even when we're dead and gone, he's not done in our family. That song, The Blessing from Gary Joe, it's a prayer actually. It's a beautiful prayer. I want to speak a little bit of this over you this morning. comes from different scriptures and from numbers. It says, may his presence go before you and behind you. May it be beside you and all around you. May he be with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping, 
and your rejoicing. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you 